Welcome to our live event today. It's all about domestic machine quilting. Some of the things we'll talk about can be used on a long arm or a mid arm or a sit down um, machine. But most of this will kind of pertain to the domestic machine because as quilters, that's what we have. And as quilters, we try or would like to be able to finish our projects ourselves. So when it comes to smaller projects, especially, those are the things that um, are very accomplishable, things that you can learn to machine quilt yourself. And those larger projects, we'll address those at the end of this episode. So if you are new to watching, I am Colleen Taufi. I'm your instructor for this event. And um, please pop in, in the comments, right underneath our picture here, under the video, um, put where you're watching from. And as the um, time progresses, if you have questions, this is your forum. That's why we do this um, kind of sharing ideas, a community of quilters. We want um, you to be able to learn from us and for other quilters to learn from each other. So please pop in if you have a question. If you have a question about what foot do I use when I'm machine quilting? If you have questions about marking a quilt, possibly. If you have, how do I layer it up? What kind of batting maybe? I have an array of things laid out today that I can help you um, find the best choice for you. So use that forum. Let us know where you're watching from. Um, Brigitte says she's watching from France. We are glad to have our international quilters joining us. Kelly saying hello from Arizona. Connie says good morning from North Dakota, I believe. First time watching. Well, wonderful. We are glad you're here. Um, realize we usually come to you every other week with live events. A lot of times they're around small projects with free patterns that you can download, which leads me to remind you that today's download is volume two of some ideas for edge to edge free motion quilting. Some of them could be used in borders, but do, um, if you haven't done so yet, you can just put your camera up to the QR code that's at the bottom of the screen. That will take you to um, where to download the information. If not, you can always come back to this uh, video. We post these um, so that they can be watched at your leisure. You can watch them over and over again um, to find the information that you need. So if you haven't done so, you can always download at the end. Know that this is volume two, that volume one is also out there, and we will have a link for that also. So we are glad that you're find, finding us here. Lynn says, good morning from hmm, Michigan, I believe. Am I? I'm hoping that's correct. <laughs> I have to remember my geography. Okay. And we have Mary watching from Florida. Judy says, good morning from from Canada. Where's our Canadian quilt quilters? Waking everybody up across the country. We are um, going to address a lot of different things about domestic machine quilting because I know... As a quilter myself, when I first started, I had enough sewing background that I can convert my my quarter inch seam down from five eighths from garment sewing to that quarter inch that's needed for quilting. I knew enough about pressing. I understood pinning. I figured out how to use my rotary cutter really quickly. And my piecing advanced very quickly because the color, the fabrics that were being used to really drew me into the piecing portion of quilting. But that machine quilting portion kind of lagged. And for a lot of us, that's the way it is. Our piecing skills can advance from, from very beginner, maybe like kindergarten piecing, maybe that first one or two items to graduate level very fast because we love working with fabrics. Let's just admit it. We love color. We can't help it. We're drawn to putting all kinds of great fabrics together, different textures, different values. But when it comes to the machine quilting, we get a little slowed down. And that was me also. So don't feel bad. Um, we have Susie saying good morning from, um, let's see, from Arizona, her first time watching live. Wonderful. We're glad you're here. Esther says, um, Hello, everybody. And she's from the Netherlands. We love to have you here. 
and Lisa is watching from Wisconsin. So in order to kind of drag everybody up into that, let's, let's get bold. Let's get into machine quilting and at least be able to do the smaller projects. I'm not saying that I am good at machine quilting a bed size quilt. That's why there's a long arm in the room next door <laughs> because I did learn to long arm. But all those small projects, I wanted to be able to do my, myself, beginning from beginning with the piecing, the fabric selection, to um, the layering it up and the quilting. So I really had to devote myself to practice. And that's what it takes to get good at machine quilting on our domestic machines. Now, the small projects that many of you have seen me create over the last couple of years since I took on this position, you will note that those I did myself. So there you can see the shadow lines of zigzag quilting back and forth kind of um, to fill in a background. And I don't know if you can pick up the meander that's in the outer border, but our, um, those skills we can accomplish. They're a different kind of movement than piecing because in piecing, we're putting our hands in that fabric and we're driving it straight through. Sometimes you might be manipulating those, those seams to make curved seams, but we don't do much of that free motion, that moving it around. The feed dogs are always our friends and they help us stay in line. But now we're gonna be mostly dropping feed dogs and doing that motion as the driver of the machine and having a, that kind of idea in our head. What do we see that in our, in our mind's eye that we want to transfer to fabric? And that can be a challenge at times. Um, we have Diane saying good morning from Spokane, Washington. Mary saying hello from Des Moines. Ooh, that's, that's my neighbor. Um, we're just a few miles from Des Moines. And Patricia saying good morning from, and loved, uh, looking forward to learning some things. And we have hmm, Zina um, saying happy spring from, oops, it was on me, um, from, ooh, I can't even, I think it's in, oh, it's in Illinois. Okay. And then Sheila saying hello from Ontario, St. Thomas, Ontario, Canada. Karen saying, um, looking Good morning from Florida. So we are really gotten the country going. So quilters, it's time to maybe take some notes, find something to jot down ideas with. If you have questions about what foot to use, I will cover some of these things, but I really want to be able to address your specific questions because if you have a question, more than likely there are at least 10 other people with the same question. And somebody just needs to be bold enough to step up and say, hey, I want to know about. So Kathy says hello from South Dakota. Maria says hello from Ohio. And Debbie says hello from Texas. So we are pretty much covered. I don't know if we've got any Californians awake yet, but we've got the country um, watching and beyond. So machine quilting. The biggest thing, I think, when it comes to machine quilting and gaining those skills is to doodle. Before we ever set up the machine, before we ever layer everything, um, I usually have a quilt top laying in front of me and it says quilt me, but I don't know for sure where to go on that project. And I have to study it. It has to kind of speak to me like, okay, I want this in this space. Um, how about this over here? Now, here are different ways to practice and get ideas simple, a notebook and pencil. I tend to doodle. In fact, I had so many notebooks upstairs that didn't have any fresh paper in them. So I had to grab something else that I had started. Even though it's a small notebook, I had, I had drawn out a shape like, oh, what if I filled like this? So what I tend to do is take a quilt like this. And I had it literally laying on the floor in front of me while I watch, was watching TV. And I drew some of these triangle shapes out and then doodled ideas for hmm, what would it look like if I filled it this way. So it doesn't have to be exact. It just has to simulate the shape. Now you can also do this like on an iPad or if you have a drawing program on your laptop. 
I have taken pictures of quilts, then put it into that drawing program, and then just doodled with my finger, which means you don't waste any paper and you don't need a pencil because you have your finger available. And I would doodle designs in that space. And if I didn't like it on the iPad, I could just tap and erase or backspace and take it all off and try something different. But the old fashioned paper and pencil works too. So doodling ideas for that space, what would it look like if, and then instead of having to spend hours and hours taking something out, because I know as a quilter, we put take and put in the stitching. It takes us maybe a minute or two. And then we spend about an hour picking it out because we've decided that's not what I wanted. And so in order to kind of bypass that time of having to tear out stitches, doodling can give you an idea ahead of time. Okay, in this space, do I want to um, fill it up and down? Do I want to fill it sideways? Do I want to do pebbling? Do I want to do straight lines, just outlining? So that's one way I can I can use the, the um, good old tablet and I will use both sides of every sheet usually as I work my way through and keep that because that is now your little um, resource because what you don't use this time might work next time on a different quilt. So don't throw these away. Keep these notebooks someplace in your, in your um, sewing studio space so that you can refer back to them. Okay, we have Kelly saying hello um, from South Dakota. Oh, those are what well, already got her in. Mary says beautiful quilting. It took a while though. It took practice. So there were times when I was making quilt sandwiches, which means those strips of batting that I may have gotten back from the long armor or trimmed from my large quilts. I didn't want to throw those away, but they work really good for making a quilt sandwich because if you're going to actually do the practicing on your domestic machine, you need to have that sandwich simulate the feel and the weight of what it's going to be like when you put it under your machine. So you need to have that batting layer in there and there are different ways of putting those layers together. Um, we have talked about batting in the past. So if you're curious about batting, we do have a video that talks all about the different kinds of batting and that there are right and wrong sides to batting. So um, I would say you can maybe search through our video lineup and find the one all about batting. Um, so that you can learn more about the different kinds of battings out there if you are really new to quilting. Or maybe you've only used 100% cotton and you're curious, well, how about wool batting? What about recycled material as batting? What does that look like? What does that um, entail? So we do have some reference to different kinds of battings. I typically will use a either 100% cotton or an 80-20 blend of a cotton polyester. The reason why I do that isn't because I love 100% cotton, which I do in my quilt fabrics, they're always 100% cotton, but the batting doesn't have to be 100% cotton. I like the way that 100% cotton shrinks up, gives me that bubbled, well-loved, well-used quilt feel, but the 80-20, an 80% cotton, 20% polyester, or even a 70-30 blend has enough cotton in it to give you that shrink, crink, crinkly kind of feel, but isn't as expensive as 100% cotton. And as we all know, cost becomes an issue in quilting. Our fabrics are not inexpensive. If um, I was at a quilt shop yesterday, $13.75 a yard is not unheard of per yard of fabric. And for those who are, aren't quilters, they would be probably a guess at how much quilt fabric does cost. But um, you can purchase fabrics at big box stores for less, but even there I can find the $10 a yard very easily. Those sales do help. But um, when you're picking that batting, think about how it's going to be used. Do you like that crinkly look? And how much can your budget afford? Because sometimes there, you know, there are times when um, our, we want something to dry fast um, 
It needs to be lightweight. Maybe a child's going to be dragging it around to and from daycare. Maybe it needs to be a polyester batting so that it dries quickly because children's quilts get washed a lot and is lightweight for them to carry. Other times we want that feel, that weight in a quilt. So that cotton um, batting does come into play, that heavier, thicker um, type feel when you sleep under a, a weighted quilt almost. So picking a batting that's appropriate for the quilt is important, but layering it up once we get, um, I'm gonna call this my top so that as I do stitching later, you can see the stitching and a backing fabric. And then to sandwich that batting layer in between. Um, I tend to, on small projects, use a spray based, but not everyone is um, able to use a spray based. Some have allergies to things, some have breathing issues, I understand. So there are other um, products out there. Even I've heard of a blue water solution that's brushed on with a paintbrush. Um, you can always use safety pins which is more of a traditional approach um, to basting the layers together. Um, and once you invest in the pins, you have no other investment to worry about. And then smaller quilts, that's a very easily um, managed thing. So, it, but when it comes to pin basting, make sure um, this is just a, a guide that I was taught to pin, um, leave no bigger space than, than your fist to pin like in four points so that you um, aren't going to have a shift in layers when you put it under the machine. Because I think most quilters find that shifting backing or shifting layers causes those crinkles or folds or tucks on different um, on the back side of your quilt and probably is one of the most common issues. So you want those layers to stay as one, making sure that you pin um, fairly closely if you're going to do pin basting. Um, let's see. Kathy says hello from near London and thank you from Indonesia. I'm probably mispronouncing because I put an English sound to your name. I am really sorry, but we are so glad that you're here with us. And then Lisa says she's originally from Perry, Iowa. I know where Perry is just up the road. Wonderful. Okay. So the spray base that I use so that those who, who may want to, to use a spray base, um, the product I use is Sulky KK2000. Comes in a small canister like this. It goes quite a ways. It can do probably four or five um, table, small table toppers with a can this size. It doesn't take much. What it does is puts down a very thin um, tackiness to the fabric, almost not quite as strong as a post-it note, but that kind of a feel. And it's repositionable. So as I pull this back, it's been bonded from this morning. I could reposition and it still has that grippability for the layers. So that is the product. My favorite of the products. Um, it does not seem to go extremely airborne when I use it. And um, in fact, I sprayed right here earlier and I have no overspray on my cutting mat at all. Um, I usually spray fairly close to the batting, just a very light mist, and then layer my fabrics together. Um, it does wash off if you do get it on something. Don't tell my husband, but yes, I did accidentally spray our wood uh, dining room table once and it, this did wash off. So there is that, um, not, it's not going to be permanently tacky on anything it falls onto. And I tend to spray um, with my items, my batting layer down so that anything that sprays up into the air, gravity pulls down. So I don't move my project so that, that any over overspray of the, the uh, product ends up falling onto the batting and not, um, if you were to spray in it upright, well, gravity is going to take any excess right to the ground instead of onto your project. So I tend to spray small projects as they're laying down. Um, let's see, Julie, do you, do you find the spray adhesives gum up your needle? No, I have not. This product, I should, I should qualify that. This product does not gum up my needle. Um, I have only used maybe one or two other products. In the past, I had problems with 
um, nozzles um, getting sticky and um, overspray going everywhere. And then I changed to this product and have not had issues with my needle getting sticky. It doesn't put down that thick of a layer and I can machine quilt an entire project and not have to clean my needle when I'm using that project, that um, product. So that's a really good question because whenever we're adding something to our fabric or our batting that has an adhesive feel to it, that's a good question when it comes to how will it affect my machine? How will it affect even the thread or the needle? Because anything with excessive tackiness or um, a really binding glue is going to be hard, number one, for the needle to get down through. And the needle has to protect the thread. So we don't want any kind of, um, as the, if the needle goes down, we don't want it to also drag on the thread, which would then cause issues with tension and balance in our, our um, machine quilting. So all those things are related when, it talk, when you're talking about something being tacky and affecting the needle would also affect the um, balance and tension in your machine. So good question, Judy. Once you get your layer, um, all your quilt sandwich prepared, um, the next thing uh, to really think about is setting up your machine. So let's set this aside for just a minute here. When we're talking about what, whoops, what we're going to quilt um, on our project, and of course, keeping water near your sewing machine is always a challenge, but we always need something to drink, right? Okay, um, we need to set up our machine depending on whether we're gonna do straight stitching or we're gonna do free motion. So for these straight lines, for those, this is probably the, the thing that quilters will do first because straight lines, we know how to do. Our machine and I work really great. And, you know, our machines, they know how to pull the fabric through. We know how to drive straight lines. We know how to outline. So a lot of us will start with an outline stitch or a stitch in the ditch. So those are the most common places to start. But when you're going to work on that quilt sandwich, you need the machine to work with you. And this presser foot does not pull the fabric. Only the bottom feed dogs pull the fabric through the machine. And so you're going to get drag on the top layer because there's a batting in between that's kind of like a, a sponge layer in between. It can cause shifting. So that's why we suggest not using a regular piecing foot when you're going to do machine quilting. So that means that you need something else to put onto your machine other than your regular piecing foot. And it could be the quarter inch foot. It could be and any of those used for piecing, those are not recommended for um, machine quilting. And I will fully admit that I thought the whole idea of a walking foot was silly because I came from garment sewing. I've done enough sewing. I thought I can quilt with a regular piecing foot. Guess what? You can't <laughs> because I found out the shift of layers is definitely measurable when you start working on even just stitch in the ditch or outline quilting. Even if you start in the center of your quilt project and work outward from there, you're going to get a shift. So get it through your your head if you have not purchased a walking foot or you don't have, uh, or you're going to maybe upgrade to a different sewing machine that an even feed foot, a dual feed foot, those are all wonderful advantages for you as a quilter. Know that those are things you want, okay? Um, let's see, double checking. Just questions as we go, okay? So Diane asked, do you spray the batting or the fabric? I spray the batting when I'm doing my layers. I, I, the directions may say something different, but I have had the best luck spraying the batting itself and then smoothing my fabric onto the batting from there. I'll do one side, flip it over, spray the back side, smooth the backing fabric, and then go back and double check that you haven't created wrinkles on the first side you start with, because you may need to adjust 
as you work back and forth to make sure everything is nice and smooth and aligned before you start your machine quilting? Good question. Um, can you use non-stick needles in case you're concerned about the spray affecting your machine? I have never used a non-stick needle, so I can't really speak to that. That's a possibility, but again, I don't have experience with that one. Sorry. <laughs> um, Maria asked, what was the name of the spray again? It's made by Sulky, S-U-L-K-Y. This product is called KK, two letter capital K's, 2000. It's a temporary spay, spray adhesive. It can be purchased online. Okay. Um, let's see. Daniel asks, when quilting on your home machine, walking foot and the uh, is the best way for a larger quilt. I even find it's the best for a smaller quilt. <laughs> I don't know if it's me or what, but I tend to have that shift. So the walking foot is a really important um, tool to have in our collection. Now, walking feet can look different from machine to machine. And every brand will create their own. Here are two, I'm going to set one sideways. It has that kind of large back piece that has a spring in it or a, a mechanism in it. And it looks kind of large in the front. Now, one of these is an open toe. You can see that my finger almost fits in the slot here. This one is not open. The open toe is my favorite. If you can acquire one that is very open so you can see exactly Either if you're going to stitch in the ditch or you're going a certain distance, it's I always like to be able to see the needle. So this open toe walking foot is my favorite, but there are many out there that just have a, a very small slit. It looks almost like a zigzag foot, but it does have the, um, it kind of has a, a tooth or a feel to the bottom. There's a mechanism that on a walking foot creates the teeth under the, the presser foot, and then you have teeth on the bottom of your machine under the, the, the plate there, and they help feed the layers together evenly. So instead of just one shoving your fabric through, you have both of them grabbing hold of the fabric and moving it forward and then jumping for the next bite to move it smoothly. And you have much better outcome when you use a walking foot for your machine. Now, that's a, the standard traditional walking foot that a lot of machines have available. Um, this happens to be a dual feed foot. Instead of having teeth, it has a roller on the bottom, kind of like a, um, a track that's rubberized and it helps pick up or hold onto the fabric as it moves it through. And this happens to belong to my baby lock machine, which is upstairs in my studio. It doesn't have as open of a toe, but um, it still works really nicely for helping feed both layers through. This also snap, um, hooks onto the, the post of the machine here, and this attaches to the back to let the machine know, oh, we're using dual feed. So it, it has a mechanism to pick that up to understand what's going on. Now, there are machines that have an integrated, I'm trying to think, integrated dual feed or an integrated, I can't remember the name of it now. <laughs> Some machines that have a lever on the back that will drop down and hook into your standard walking or uh, standard um, piecing foot. So it clips on the back and it helps to walk the fabric through. Those are also um, built in so you don't have to worry about, some people don't like having to stop and attach something to their machine. That uh, built-in type mechanism is an advantage for some people. So um, if you happen to be looking for a new machine or if you have that mechanism, that can help when you're doing um, the machine quilting on your domestic machine. Um, Marge did say that she had an adhesive spray that did gum up her needle. Now, I don't know what brand that was. Marge, do you happen to remember which brand you were using when um, you had that issue? I have not had that happen on the Sulky. Maybe too much spray can cause that. I don't know, but um, I guess be aware that some quilters have experienced that. Okay. So dual feed, that's for doing straight lines, which is really good at the very beginning of your quilting process to do stitch in the ditch. 
and stitch in the ditch or outlining, which means like putting, I've heard other um, instructors call it putting the bones into the quilt, the skeleton of your quilt. So when I go to start a project like this, I go in and then this one I used a white thread because I was going to be mostly driving on the white fabric. I did just an really close. I'm not stitching in the ditch. I'm staying really close to the fold, the seam line. And I put in a structure all the way around each of these red triangles. And then in the ditch between the pieced portion, the first inner border. So there's white there. Then I changed threads, colors, and went to red so that I could do um, in the ditch or near the ditch in the red area. And if I hold this up, hopefully, maybe the camera will pick up the threads there so that I have structure to what I'm going to machine quilt later. That also will keep things kind of in place, giving it the bones of the project so that I can go back then later and do this machine quilting and not get a large shift in the in the area. If I were just to outline this whole entire center section and then go back to quilt here, <clears throat> excuse me, I may get a shift in the small piecing areas and then not have a nice straight line to identify those triangles. So by doing that, stitch in the ditch or really close outlining of the shapes, I can put that structure, that bone structure into the project and then go back into the certain sections that I want to do more machine quilting, more free motion quilting, and then I can add that interest and texture at that point. But always know that that stitch in the ditch used to be kind of the default. I'll just stitch in the ditch that'll hold all the layers together and I won't need to quilt anything else. But we realized that didn't add as much texture or interest to the project. Yes, it does hold everything in place and it may be quilted close enough to be able to be laundered and look interesting, but that's a good structure. That's a great beginning, but let's amp that up just a little bit more and have a little bit more fun in the other sections of the quilt. Beth says, hello from Florida. Use the even feed walking foot for the most of her quilting and love it. Perfect. But now we get really comfortable with that even feed foot. Let's change the, the foot on our machine to something a little bit more adventurous. Okay, we are gonna talk about <clears throat> the different kinds of feet that are available and I have a variety here because <clears throat> I own a variety of sewing machines, sorry to say, um, predominantly using either a brother or a baby lock, but I do have a Viking machine also. So there are two feet here that belong to my Viking and therefore using um, to do that free motion. These have what I call a hopper foot. So if I were to hold on to this, it has a spring mechanism here. And so it bounces along as it kind of guides or glides over the fabric as I'm doing the free motion. Because without anything there, the, as the needle comes up, your fabric may want to jump up a little bit too. And this keeps um, the layers together, but lets the machine do that jump as, as we're taking stitches. And this one is, well, let's see if I can get it up so you can see it, has just a cup-shaped Oops, for me to even see. It has kind of a U-shaped hook where the um, kind of a foot. This one has a plastic square with a triangle in the center, kind of a shield. And so it sits on the, on the fabric a little bit larger. You can see through it. It has a grid so you can kind of tell if I'm approaching a seam or I want to outline a certain distance but free motion and I can kind of see, oh, I'm getting close to where I maybe don't want to go. Um, this is one other available that was worked on my Viking machine. The um, brother and the baby lock that I have upstairs have similar uh, walking feet or a free motion foot, I'm sorry. And it has just a hook shape on here, kind of a squared off hook. And again, it has that spring mechanism so that 
it bounces along the top of my fabric as I move the fabric through the machine. Now, if you don't have these for your machine and you're going to be going to purchase one, make sure that you know if you have high shank or low shank, um, the, the mechanism where it hooks to the needle post here has to be in the proper um, position. So if you're searching for one and you're at a, a, um, a quilt shop or a machine uh, vendor, make sure you have the model of your machine with you so that they can reference to double check to make sure you get the right free motion foot for your machine. Um, sometimes they have squared off open toe like that. Sometimes it's a circular toe, uh, more like a horseshoe kind of shape. And other times they're actual round um, where the needle goes down through, but every machine is a little bit different for um, how that is shaped for the machine. Let's go ahead and put this one the free motion foot onto the machine so that it's set up to do a little free motion quilting here. And we can talk about the different types of stitches that we can do and how we um, grip the fabric layer, how we, um, how fast we're moving, how we practice those designs. Always make sure that you have it attached tightly. Um, you don't want to have it come off in the middle of quilting. Um, why do I know these things? <laughs> because I've had them all happen, probably. Um, let's see. Beth says, hello from Florida. I use the, the walking foot. Whoop, I think I had Beth earlier. Um, Deborah X, X says, actually at a quilt workshop right now, watching as I sew. Well, let's talk about um, multitasking. You are a queen at multitasking evidently. Okay, every time I sit down to do machine quilting, it's usually been a little while since I've done it. So that means it's time to warm up um, your brain, warm up your hands, um, get everything ready and out that you need. Now, some people will use discs, discs that they put on top of their fabric to hold onto. Some use a horseshoe shaped ring to hold the fabric. Um, some will use little slip things they put onto their fingers to hold the fabric. The whole idea is that you need to be in control of the fabric. So in order to do that, now this is a pair of quilting gloves that I have had for a long time. They look exactly like gardening gloves that have the little beads on the inside or the tackiness. Those work. You can actually buy them at the, at the local big box store for gardening because it's gardening season right now and they're less expensive and maybe the ones you might find at your quilt shop. Um, they might be a polyester. They could be a cotton. Find ones that fit your hands. Um, I've used ones like this with the beads on them. I've had a variety of different brands over the years. Um, this is a brand called Machingers. And, whoops, sorry about that. This is the brand that I like the best because they're very lightweight. They... Um, fit my fingers because I kind of have short fingers and the tips and you can, and I will admit they are not perfectly clean because I use them a lot. They have kind of tackiness to the tips and you can see where I hold on to the fabric. So that's what's going to happen to yours too, as you um, get experience using them. But as I put my fabrics underneath of the well up, uh, machine, I have a piece here that I've quilted on before, and I use that to kind of warm up my hands and my brain because, you know, you're jumping into something different. So you need to kind of warm up everything to get that kind of feel loose in your um, shoulders and in your hands. Make sure that you have your feed dogs dropped so that you now have control over the uh, machine. I'm going to go down and back up. I'm going to pull my threads to the top so that I don't run over them and cause a big nesting on the bottom. Then, and I'm starting off the edge here because I'm just doing a warm up. If you're starting in a project, I, I tend to, when I go to put in like the bones of a quilt like this, I tend to start in a corner, pull my threads to the bottom later. So I have long tails of, um, threads and um, tie them off to the back side. 
But if you're starting on the outer edge, like doing border, I will start off the edge and just drive my way into the area that I'm going to machine quilt. So it kind of depends on um, what you do with the tails, depending on where you're starting from. Um, let's see. Well, let's just do a little quick warm up so that you can kind of hear how fast the machine is running, how I position my hands, and um, kind of that warm up to machine quilting. A lot of times, our biggest issue is that we go too slow. And the speed of our hands and the speed of the needle need to work together. So let me drive off here. The reason why I keep a piece like this around is that because it's my practice sheet, I can run over and over and over and over. Just because I've used it once doesn't mean that it's done being used. So you're going to see two different colors here. Red is today. Gray was another day. And I'm double checking to make sure that my balance is correct. Most of the time, if we have issues with balance on our domestic machine, it's the top thread that needs adjusting. So in order to kind of get a wet skirt, having to deal with tension very much, I tend to use the same thread top and bottom. So that may also affect what it looks like on the back because I did a lot of white quilting on this um, table topper you will see white thread on the back because if I change threads and put a dark navy blue or a red on the bottom and have white on the top, I'm going to have a really hard time keeping my thread balanced, my tension balanced. I'm going to have one or the other poking either white to the bottom or blue to the top. And I don't want that. So to alleviate that, I usually always use the same thread top as in the bobbin. So matching thread will alleviate that issue because if one thread is heavier than the other, you'll have tension issues keeping it balanced. Um, and if it's a different color, you'll have maybe a pull up or a pull down of little dots of color where you don't want them. So by keeping the thread colors matched and the same weight of thread, I have better luck getting an, a, an end product that looks nice when I'm finished. Now, when it comes to the speed I was talking about, when you're moving your hands to machine quilt, if you're going too slow, you're going to get elbows, which means instead of a nice smooth curve, you're going to kind of get bump, 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 and it's, that is not going to look as smooth. So you need to match your the speed at which you move your hands with um, how fast you run your machine. Now, in order to do those kinds of curves, and get used to those. I talked about um, using a tablet and practicing. Another way you can practice is on a marker board or a whiteboard. And this one literally has a design on it that a customer wanted that I left hanging in my long arm room because I wanted to remember, oh yeah, I did those kind of big blooms, but you can practice at any size. Once you get the motion down, you can either make it larger or you can make it smaller. So a marker board is a really great way to practice and you don't have to use paper again. So um, by getting that smooth curl, it floats a little easier than a pencil on paper so that you can practice that design and get a smooth motion because your hand and your eye working together to create those curves that you're going to want to do on the machine later. And yes, I know this is the needle and I'm moving the needle right now, but the idea is to pattern the curves, the motion of how will I get from this space all the way to another and not leave an opening somewhere. So it's very easy to use a marker board, dry erase, and then go back practice again. If you got yourself into a desert and you can't figure out how should I have filled that corner, you start again and practice something different. Now, the fun part about this is that there's so many possibilities and you can use the internet to create a whole 
bank of ideas because there are so many machine quilters out there who are willing to share their ideas and their designs so that you can be mesmerized by the way they they fill an area or come up with a shape that, oh, I never thought of that before. Like I can do the teardrop and an echo, but I never thought of adding that plume to the outer edge of it. And this is a great way to practice those ideas. And the downloadable that we have today has that one included in it. So you have some ideas of um, different designs that you can practice. Uh, there are, oh, let's see. I think there's 12 in the new section. Lazy Lines is one that um, at first I was very wary of because I was like, is that really machine quilting if I just do a lazy line like this? But when I did much, uh, more of it, I realized it creates kind of emotion in my quilting. And one of the quilts on my bed most of the winter had lazy lines across it. And I loved the way it felt when I walked into the room. It just had that relaxing, floating on water feel to it. So don't count out lazy lines. They have a little bit of curve to them. They let you um, have some adventure, but maybe not so much curve if you're not quite ready for that. But we have 12 designs in the second volume that we've put out, give you ideas of something to somewhere to start in your machine quilting process so that you can go through that stack of tops that you may have and create a unique because everything that you quilt is going to be your signature a machine machine quilted by you project finished from beginning to end all yours so thanks for joining me today until next time